He's our next speaker, Soybean Management Practices to Increase Yields. Chris is a sales agronomist for his family's company, Euler Brothers Company, here in Champaign County. U of I grad, the first recipient of the association's Master Soybean Advisor Award back in 2017. Some of his clients have hit it multiple times on the Illinois Soybean Association Yield Challenge and certainly a pioneer in the trend of early soybean planting. Please welcome Mr. Chris Ehler. Thanks, Delos. Laura, I've got to ask the question for everybody in the room because I know you wanted to ask it, but you were afraid to. Did my volunteer corn count as a cover crop? Because I blew, grew a hell of a volunteer corn crop last year. I had people ask me, is, like, is this a new cover crop? I was like, no, it's just a, a lack of a frost. It's great to be back in person at the Soybean Summit. And I can remember attending that last Soybean Summit in 2020, right before what felt like the entire world shut down. So again, to be here, I'm, I'm very honored. Um, my name is Chris Ehler, sales agronomist for Ehler Brothers. Um, what we're gonna dive into today is high yield management strategies in soybeans. We're gonna cover optimizing our seed treatments, our planting dates, seeding rates, and some in season management tools. So one thing I get asked, why don't growers see yield increases year to year? And one of the things is growers rely or they think they're relying on the companies, the seed companies, to bring the yield to them. But if we look at some data presented by the University of Illinois uh, Department of Consumer Economics, that's not true. We're not delivering at the rate of increases that we need to be sustainable just through genetics and breeding. If you're comfortable with a half a bushel increase or three tenths of a bushel increase per year, that's not gonna cut the mustard. Other things that, that reasons why growers are slow to see yield increases, they're slow to incorporate those new products on their farm. The big thing, they're in love with corn. Corn is soybeans biggest obstacle. I think we missed the mark in an in a advertising campaign a couple years ago when let's, let's face it, soybeans we're keeping the farm in the black because we kept growing corn and we were losing money doing it, but we loved corn because corn's sexy. We love growing it. And soybeans, it's the rotational crop. I think the marketing campaign during those years where soybeans were keeping the farm afloat was soybeans. It's not just a rotational crop anymore. Seriously, it kept the farm afloat. And again, we're not doing on-farm evaluations or plots on our farm. These are our acres, our fertility, our program. Why don't you evaluate those products on your acre to see what the return is on your acre? Because everybody's got something to sell you that's gonna give you that magical five bushel increase if you spray it on your soybeans. Well, put it into your program and see if you get a response. So what is that response? And the other thing, can't afford any extras. Growers, I can see what soybeans are doing on the Board of Trade. That's not an excuse moving forward. Now, yes, supply chain issues have increased cost of goods, but it's still relative. We still have great opportunities to incorporate some things onto our farms to evaluate them on our acres. Here's what I call the givens for a successful program. This, these are things that I say every single grower in this room should be doing just to obtain yield. Again, fertility for that yield goal. I like easy math, real easy math. So I put 100 bushel up there because again, we're talking in, in 100 increments and it's easy to do the math. So we need 110 pounds of phosphorus, 230 pounds of potassium, and 450 to 500 pounds of nitrogen to grow a 100 bushel soybean crop. I want weed competition not to be an issue. I want you choosing the best yielding genetics within a herbicide platform that gives you control of the weeds that you are trying or fighting on your farm. So if there is a weed that another platform doesn't cover that you're not gonna get control of, you're gonna get pushed into a different platform, weed control. We've got to keep our weeds under control. But also, we want the best yielding genetics. Sometimes you don't get your cake and get to eat it too. 
Talk to other high yield producers, find out what they're doing and what's working for them. Again, doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work on your farm. Timing is everything. And if you just incorporate a product that your neighbors had success with, that doesn't mean that you're gonna have success with it. But again, if you keep hearing of a certain product, certain practice that neighbors are using that's increasing their yields, investigate it. And again, this one's a tough one. I see a lot of growers driving the struggle bus when it comes to remaining optimistic and open-minded. That gets tough at times for growers. Keep an open mind. Be willing to learn. A lot of great minds out there, especially in this East Central Illinois area when it comes to high, high soybean yields. Let's dive into one of my favorite things, maximizing seed real estate. I, I tell growers, you have eight ounces of opportunity per 100 pounds of seed. What does that mean? That means for every 100 pounds of seed, we can put about eight ounces of product on it. But Chris, I plant treated seed. I get that. That's low hanging fruit. That's your fungicide insecticide. And we say standard treatment, that means there's two, three, maybe four fungicides and an insecticide. But there's still room on that seed for some other products. Those could be SDS products, Saltro, Olivo. Guys, gals, we are in a time period where early planted soybeans, it's real. It's not going away. It continues to grow every year. You know what else is growing? Our yields. That's why Illinois is awesome. You guys were fast to incorporate early planting. And that's why we'll always be the number one soybean producing state. Iowa has no chance. Sorry, Ben. Nematicides. Here's a really low use rate type products. We're talking tenths of an ounce per hundred pounds. Plenty of room. Nematodes are yield robbing pests. We've got tools in the toolbox to overcome that. Inoculants. Inoculants are one of my favorite things. Very consistent year in, year out. We'll dive deeper into that in a little bit. Growth promoters and micronutrients. Some people give me a little slack on my picture of my treated seed. Chris, you don't have sexy treated seed up there. I mean, my seed's shiny. It's like staring in the bumper of a 1957 Chevy. It's, it looks chrome. What am I missing on that that I didn't put up here? Finishing products. I'm not a fan of them, and here's why. One of them is called titanium dioxide. Who brushed their teeth this morning? Raise your hand. God, I hope everybody raised your hand. If you forgot to brush your teeth, raise your hand and just pretend like you did. And smile like that, too. Titanium dioxide. Grab my toothpaste this morning. I'm looking across it. Last ingredient, titanium dioxide. It's the shiny stuff that makes it look pretty. It also goes on seed. Titanium dioxide will also kill your nematodes. They don't go well together. I don't like a product who's non-functional. Yes, it creates a little bit of lubrication. You use less talc, less graphite. But you know what else doesn't stick to seed when you use those finishing products? Everything else, the dry products. If you wanna use a biological, it's not gonna stick to the seed. They also make an inoculant that's a graphite. Not gonna stick to the seed. So again, I don't want to shut the door to opportunities to put things onto the seed. It might look pretty. Companies tout, look at how good my seed looks. But I want a functional product. So that's why I'm not a huge fan, again, of those finishing products. Here's a seed treatment example. Um, again, our base treatment's about three and a half ounces per 100 pounds. I say base treatment, that's your fungicides and your insecticide. We add in a nematicide, again, really low use rate. Then I've also thrown in here Bioforge Advance. I'm kind of a fan of the product. Um, if we don't use inoculants, what Bioforge Advance is gonna do for us, it's got cobalt and molybdenum. Those are two micronutrients that are kind of signaling nutrients for nodulation. So it's gonna tell those rhizobia that are in the soil, hey, let's start a relationship. It's gonna be real nice. It's gonna be all season long. I'm gonna help you, you're gonna help me. Um, Two ounce product. So again, we still got plenty of room on that seed for maybe something else. Do we wanna use a, 
a, a, an SDS type product, we've got room for it. Here's another example. Again, your base treatment, about three and a half ounces. We toss in that SDS product, Saltro. Saltro and Olivo, let's talk about them real quick. Two really great products. Both give protection against SDS. We are planting soybeans earlier. Cooler, wetter soils, higher likelihood of an environment that's gonna have and show SDS infection in the growing season. Why I choose Saltro? It's easy, I'm a proponent of early planting. We use a lot of PPOs in East Central Illinois. What happens when we get in that little cool rain event after that soybeans emerged, we get some PPO damage and it burns the cotyledons. Well, Olivo also has a haloing effect on that cotyledon. And when we stack those stress events on that seedling, that's a lot of stress. Soybeans can handle a lot of stress. You can knock them around and we'll talk about mechanical damage to increase yields. But when you get too much stress on a seedling, that's not a good thing because sometimes those plants recover a lot slower. Here's a take a look at treatment trials from Ehler Brothers Company. This is two year average data. When we look at the Saltro response, SDS, again, these are when we plant our plots, we're, we're trying to plant our soybeans in April, uh, the two years, yes, they were both planted within the April 20s uh, in 20 and 21. We saw a two bushel response. SDS products aren't cheap. They're gonna cost you anywhere from 10 to $11 to get it on the seed. But soybeans are what? About 14 bucks on the board right now. We're still putting money in our pocket and we're protecting that plant. Inoculants, you can get an inoculant on the seed for about four bucks. This one again, like I said, inoculate every acre every single year. That Brady rhizobia, none of it's native to our soils, all introduced. If you haven't inoculated in the last five, 10 years, do it, start to incorporate it. See what your responses are. You will see a response. Again, when we talk about nitrogen needs for a soybean, if we want to grow 100 bushels, we need almost 500 pounds of nitrogen. Do you want to just say, yeah, I think I've got some rhizobia in my soil. Yeah, I, th I think I've got good nodulation. Or do you want to put something on the seed that guarantees that plant to be in the best position to capture that atmosphere again? So 1.6 bushels. The other thing I've got on here is sulfur. Let's talk about sulfur. At some point in the industry, whether it's corn or soybeans, we just need to call it NPKS because sulfur is just as important as the macros and it's not just a micronutrient. It is, it is truly important. And we don't get the sulfur from the atmosphere that we've gotten in the past. So what are we doing to supplement sulfur for soybeans? Couple options, ammonium thiosulfate with your pre-plant chemical. Proceed with caution. If you wanna make cottage cheese, we can make cottage cheese. And your retailer's not gonna be happy that you wanted ATS with your herbicide. Not a lot of the soybean herbicides are compatible with ATS, unfortunately. It's not like corn. We can't dump it in and pretty much go. We need a compatibility agent with a lot of the herbicides that are out there if we're going the ATS route. But growers, we're making that application with that herbicide. Let's, let's put a sulfur product in there. The other option would be AMS broadcast. Here's kind of a season long, slow release type product. Gonna get, give us a little bit along the way throughout the entire growing season. That nitrogen really ain't gonna dump till about uh, 60 days into the growing season. And when we talk about nodulation, those nodules begin to slow down as we get into the mid to late reproductive phases. So if we can dump a little bit of nitrogen, make it available as those nodules slow down, that's not a bad thing. A Couple other options, microessentials S10 or MESZ and elemental sulfur. If you attended agronomy day, Dr. Belo's team did a fantastic job and one of the presenters uh, was Vitor Favoretto. Vitor did a fantastic job presenting their sulfur data. And here's kind of the takeaways from that presentation. Sulfur is needed in our high yield environments. That's clear, whether it's corn or soybeans. The key for sulfur fertility 
is season-long availability. What's the most mobile nutrient of all the nutrients we try to apply? Sulfur. What did it do a lot last year? The rain. We had a wet growing season. So we might have, if we didn't make any sulfur applications, we may have been sulfur deficient towards the tail end of the growing season. How can we get sulfur available throughout the entire growing season? Sources that have sulfur with other nutrients lead to more consistent yield responses, specifically nitrogen. So that's, that's why AMS is kind of a really good product to deliver sulfur for soybeans. If we want that 15 to 20 pounds of sulfur, we're gonna apply somewhere around 70 to 75 pounds of AMS. That will get us where we need to be on that additional sulfur. Here's my favorite thing to talk about. If you follow me on any social medias, whether it's the Little Blue Bird or the Spacebook, you'll find me planting soybeans as early as I can. And I've got January on my bucket list. I've got about 20 more growing seasons to make it happen. And it will happen. I'm gonna plant soybeans in January so I can say I've had successful soybean planting in January, February, March, April, May, June, and I've planted soybeans in July as well. So April planting is shown to outyield our May planting dates in our Ehler Brothers trials, six to 10 bushels per acre. So the last 10 years, and I've been doing this for 13, I just did the last 10 years data, 6.4 bushel, April versus May. That's low hanging fruit, that's easy money. Again, I'll tell you that most, most retailers have something to sell you. I'm gonna sell you this to get you a yield increase. What's it going to cost me? You know what it costs to grow your, plant your soybeans early? Nothing. Zero. It's a management practice. But we're picking up almost 100 bushel per acre? Pretty easy. On average, growers give up about a half a bushel per day when planting soybeans after May 10th. Anybody go to the Better Bean Series in the northern part of the state? Anybody attend that? Yeah, Jason Carr was there. What date did he say? April 25th. I think we're, we're moving away from that May 10th back to April 25th that we're, we're giving up four to five tenths of a bushel per day when we plant after April 25th with soybeans. Why is that? Soybeans harvest sunlight. They capture sunlight. The earlier we can have them growing, the earlier we can have them building a robust machine, the more yield we're gonna produce because we're gonna capture that light energy and turn it into yield. Longest day of the year, June 21st, the summer solstice. And again, we wanna initiate flowering in that first week of June. My birthday's June 1st. I'm a guy and I have no problem standing in front of a room of, of guys and gals saying, I want flowers for my birthday. Give me flowers, but I just want them on a soybean plant. Here's the early planting trials. Again, 6.4 bushel. If we look at a couple years in particular, 2017 and 2016, those are almost 10 bushel per acre gain years. But again, 10 year average, 6.4. I get asked a lot of times too, Chris, have you ever had a crop failure in your early planting trials? 13 years, I had one crop failure. You wanna guess what year it was? Everybody's favorite year, 2020. If you're gonna fail, it's gonna be 2020. I still had results in 2019 because I snuck in right before all the wet weather of that 2019 wet growing season. But what happened in, in uh, 2020, uh, we had a freeze event. I, I'm not calling it a frost event because it was truly a freeze event. We were down to 23, 24 degrees at 4 a.m. And it sustained extremely cold, that frost set in and I lost about two thirds of my stand. I still was able to capture 50 bushel off that trial. I didn't replant into it. My final stand was about 34,000 and I still captured 50 bushel. What I call a, a, a failure in my book is if I can't keep up with the county average. So I can still have frost events and I'm still out yielding the county average. So early planting the soybeans, again, I talked about we want to build a bigger factory. 
Bigger factory withstands mid-season stress events. That plant can recover faster because there's more biomass there to do so. It can reallocate nutrients after a big rain, saturated soils, and it can get started growing again. We wanna increase our total nodes. If we're planting in late May or early June, our node potential is a lot less than a soybean that's planted in April. Again, we talk about intercepting more light during reproductive phases, um, R1 through R3. We've got a bigger plant there. Earlier planting means we're planting into cooler soils. We've been down this road before with corn. When we plant into cooler soils, microbes don't get that party going until about 50 degrees. So let's look at nutrient availability based off of soil temperatures. Nitrogen. Nitrogen is not coming available until we reach 50 degrees. Then we look at phosphorus and potassium, two key nutrients for soybeans, 65 and 70. Do you think the soil temperature is getting to 65 or 70 degrees in mid-April? Maybe in the top inch and a half, two inches of conventional tilled, good black dirt, maybe. Sulfur, 55 degrees, and zinc availability is five times lower at 50 versus 65. Those are key things to keep in mind as we plant soybeans earlier. Our key soybean micros, iron, manganese, molybdenum, boron, zinc. So if we're making applications during the growing season, here's a couple key micros that you should key in on to make sure your, your micronutrient foliar blend has. So we talked about this nutrient availability. Why, why did we use starter on corn? Why do we have starter systems on corn? Remember back in the day when we planted corn first, when we were planting corn in mid-April? Mid Soil temperatures, a little questionable, but we're going. We've got starter. We've got available forms of nutrients. And I'm saying starter, it's just not for corn. So some great research by Jason Webster up at the PTI farm is showing some really great responses out of starter. So this is utilizing Marco's NutriStart Boost. Pretty simple formulation, 103040 ATS. And they're putting it in there, it's on with their concealed product. Look what they're gaining. At 10 gallon, three inches out, half an inch down, we're picking up 3.4 bushel this year and five bushel at the 15 gallon rate. We're positive returns right there on our investment. But we're planting into cooler soils. Now we've got available nutrients. Here's a big thing. Again, I saw this first study in 2018. Now he takes the data and compiles it in an average from 2018 through 2021. Looks like that 10 gallon rate is a very uh, profitable rate to go with. We're picking up $46 an acre. If you're not familiar with Conceal, this is what it looks like. There is a knife in the center of the gauge wheel. When that gauge wheel engages, that knife comes out. And now you can place nutrients three inches away from the furrow at an inch and a half depth. Pretty neat system. Starter, it's just not for corn anymore. Again, as we, we incorporate early planting, we need to recognize nutrient availability and what nutrients, what blend of starter is going to be best for our soybeans. Planting densities and depth. I get a lot of questions on this. So going to put this slide up there to, these are my thoughts. If you're in a conventional tillage, 15, 20 inch narrow rows, I like to see you somewhere around 125 to 130,000 drop. Again, I recognize that we're, we're seeing some stuff in the industry at, at a 90 or 100,000 drop showing really good economic returns. But at some point, the shoe's going to drop. And if you're dropping 90 to 100 and we have that challenging spring, you get to do it again. I don't like replant situations. And really the differences between 100,000 and 125 drop on economics isn't a lot, but it gives us a, a nice buffer. We're not overpopulating, but still a very, very good solid population. 30 inch rows, 125,000. If you're in a no-till situation, take those recommendations, increase them by roughly 10%. If we get into later planting situations, I'm saying that's after May 15th. 
add 5 to 7% per week. Because what we're doing there, we're not going to have the nodes. We're replacing nodes with plants. So every week past May 15th, add 5 to 7% and keep doing it every subsequent, subsequent week. Because again, we're replacing plants for nodes. So lower seeding densities for early planted soybeans. This is something that people question me on too. You look at some of the data that's out there, whether it's uh, Beck's information or the PTI farm, we're actually getting more seeds germinated in earlier planting than later planting. Growers, we use seed treatments, they're working. I want you to lower that seeding rate just a little bit in early planting scenarios, because I know that we're gonna have more nodes on that plant. If we're stacking up more nodes, we're gonna have a taller plant. Last thing I wanna do is get in, into a lodging situation. If a plant lodges, we're losing yield. We're losing yield potential. The other thing is we wanna kinda play the curve when it comes to, to early planting. So we know that the soil is gonna be colder. We know that the potential for frost risk, risk is there. We've had two back-to-back -back years, Mother Day frost events. 2020s was a little bit more scary than 2021s because 2020, we were, the soil was wet. And if you don't, don't have the heat in the soil, then that frost allows to set in further. 2021, different scenario. We were really dry. Drier soils warm up more. We kind of had a halo effect. That frost never really set into the fields because we had so much heat coming out of the ground. If it's drier, soil warms up. You've got more density in the soil and in a wet soil, saturated soil. So again, I want to sock those beans in at two inches, maybe two and a quarter inches if I'm planting before April 10th. You can back that off to an inch and a half, inch and three quarters, April 10th through 12th, and then an inch and a quarter, inch and a half any, any time there later. Here's where I look across the room. I watch growers' eyes roll in the back of their head. We start talking hormones and auxins and ratios and stuff like that. This is uncharted territory. I've got twin three-year-old girls. Ten years from now, talking about hormones isn't going to be as fun as it is right now, so I'm going to get it out of the way. Jerry Stoller, who started Stoller USA, was a U of I guy. Stoller was big into hormones and auxins and vegetable crops, and then got into the row crops. Jerry said it best when he said, the brains of a plant are its roots. Why? Because four out of the five major hormones are produced in a plant's roots. That's where the brains of the plant are at. It doesn't matter if it's corn or soybeans. So what we'll talk about is the balance of auxin synthesis of cytokinin to gibberellic acid, that ratio, and how it affects plant physiology and plant growth. Those ratios really determine that plant's architecture, its growth pattern. So, higher populations decrease root space. We can agree with that. The more plants we got packed in, that root space gets smaller. This reduces the cytokine levels and increases the auxin levels. We spread that balance. What happens? Plants with more auxin than cytokinin grow tall and lanky. Soybeans wrote the book on algorithms. It's kind of a buzzword in agriculture these days, algorithm-based modeling. We're going to use mathematics to tell us what we need to do, when we need to apply, how much. Well, soybeans wrote the book on that. They're so smart. Because out of the ground, they spatially can say, yep, I know where that guy's at. I know where that guy's at. I've got this much space. At the same time, they're collecting sunlight. Oh, the days are getting longer by this much. So now I can calculate how many nodes I can, I can produce. I know spatially what I've got. I know what the sun's doing. So now I'm going to form an algorithm to say, I'm going to produce this many branches and this many nodes. Pretty cool stuff. The opposite's going to occur when more root space is available, cytokinin levels get higher. So this hormone balance will determine the size and shape of a plant along with your fertility and the yield environment. That's why hormones and auxins are so important. 
Again, growers tend to, to get that glazed over deer in the headlight looks when we talk about it, but it is a very significant part. And once you understand it, we can start to possibly influence our yield goals with those products as well. So yield determination stages. Who can tell me in the room when corn determines its yield? By V? By V4, V5. I, it's amazing. Everybody knows corn. At what growth stage will soybeans determine the number of branches? That's the typical response, crickets. It's V2, V3. We hear about this mechanical damage, the rolling. Growers using large rollers to do mechanical damage to get a response out of that soybean at V2, very early V3. Now, you can go late V3, but your yields are going to be negative because that plant's too big. You're actually breaking off the parts of the plant. But if you do it early enough, you're just basically stressing that plant and its response, like any good plant, produce more yield, more branches. We can manage population, as I talked about, based off of hormones and auxins, to influence branching and less internode growth. If we make that plant go out, then it's not going to go as far up. Less lodging. What growth stage will soybeans set the number of nodes? Think of it like V5 for corn. Because that's really a driving factor for yield, the number of nodes. The plant will set its max number of nodes. It can decrease this number, but it can't go past it. And that's set, again, at V5. So what can we do? Knowing what we know about, her, uh, about auxins and hormones, we can make an application with our early, our first pass post in that V2, V3 stage. I know there's not a lot of foliage there, but these are hormones and auxins. It doesn't take much to move the needle. And we might be able to influence the total number of nodes, the total number of branches. I did a, a study uh, in 2018 in my high yield 30 inch rows, I dropped 152,000. I had plants on top of plants on top of plants on top of plants. Came out there at V2 and made a hormone auction application and I still got those plants to branch. Even though they were so stacked up on top of each other, they knew that they had no root growth, no root space, which meant I'm sending that auction and cytokine and balance way out. So they were gonna wanna grow up. But I put something on them to say, nope, we're going to still throw some branches, and they did. So let's understand the components of soybean yield. First off, pods, the number of pods on a plant. It's easy. The number of beans per pod. Seed size, ultimately seed weight. Everything you do in the growing season should attempt to influence the number of pods on a plant, which is also your number of nodes, and the seed size, seed weight. These are two things that we do have control of. Now, when it comes to the number of beans in a pod, we struggle. We do. We struggle there. That one, we haven't been able to figure out a way to influence the number of beans in a pod. So you heard Delos say, there's a guy on the internet planting soybeans in February. If you want to make a video of planting soybeans in February, you better plan on people wanting to watch it for one reason. The reason why we watch videos on the internet, watching people fail. It's the age old thing. So again, this is kind of where I gained traction with that early planting. What I wanted to do was show them, show growers that I could do it in February with great results. So they're comfortable doing it in the middle of April, a much better environment. So here, this picture was taken on July 13th, 2017, the year that I planted in February. Look at the difference in plant structure. Same variety, just a different planting date. I'm going to ask you the easiest question that you'll be asked all day. Which plant do you want? That one or that one? There's a little bit difference in yield potential, I'd say there. Uh, I would even take the, the March or the April plant. 
So here's another one taken from last growing season. Uh, again, almost similar uh, time frame, July 17th. There's April 7th. That was the typical checkered flab drop right after Easter Sunday. Growers were out there planting. Um, look at the difference between April 7th and April 19th and the number of pods on those plants in comparison to that May 14th. And May 14th wasn't really a, a, a late date 10 years ago. We were planting soybeans later than that. Look at the yield potential we missed out on. So summer solstice, June 21st, I call it the soybean holiday. Guys, gals, this is a great opportunity to grab your cooler, grab your lawn chair, sit in front of your favorite soybean field and crack open that cold soda pop and then just take it all in. It's the longest day of the year. Soybeans, again, we want those flowers initiated in that first week of June. That's a great uh, metric for yield potential. We want to increase our noting potential. That's why we plant early. We get that quicker canopy. Dr. Hager, there's no better weed control, right, than a, than a good canopied soybean field. They did a great study this year, too, looking at herbicides and early planting. I can't wait to see multiple years of that data because, again, we've shifted. It's not going away. The plants spend more time in that late vegetative and reproductive phases. I've been out to scout a field for a fungicide application, went out there and looked at it, said, I'm somewhere between R2, R1 and R2. And at that point, I went back a couple days later and it almost went, like, it went backwards. Because again, they're hanging out longer in those late vegetative and reproductive stages. So let's play offense and defense. I think everybody loves a good offensive scheme. I mean, I do too. I love it when you can put points on the board and when we equate it to, to farming, it's yield. So offensively, we're using hormones and auxins, growth promoters, plant nutrition, fungicides. Defensively though, you heard it before, defense wins championships. Stress reducers, fungicides to protect the plant, insecticides to protect the plant, nematicides to protect the plant. Protect that yield potential. So R2 and R3 applications, I think most growers have incorporated some sort of R2, R3, fungicide, insecticide. I say a good insecticide. Because let's face it, when we start stacking the insects that are out there working against us, Japanese beetles, stink bugs, bean leaf beetles, green clover worms, um, there is no threshold when we stack insect feeding. A cheap pyrethroid versus a good residual, we used to get away with it. We did it early on, because why? Because it was cheap. But it, a pyrethroid at 90 degrees, is, is, it's gonna degrade its half-life with, within a couple hours. It's a knockdown only. Give me a residual because of the, all the insect pests that we're dealing with. Utilize tissue samples going into any of these applications. See if you've got any nutrient deficiencies. So let's look at some of the pest data, I'm gonna point a couple things out real quick. Bean leaf beetles, let's roll it back to 2019. What happened in 2019? Really wet, delayed spring. Pushed our harvest late, started raining. We didn't get tillage done. Pushed a lot of growers into a very uncomfortable realm of no-till. There was a lot of cover. We had a mild winter to boot. What that allowed was bean leaf beetles to hunker down in all that no-till. And by the next year, our second generation of bean leaf beetles was off the charts, especially in that central and northern part of the state. There were, and we were dry that fall. I felt terrible for the growers in the northern part of the state because they were literally making insecticide applications to salvage yield in late August, early September because the bean leaf beetle was so bad, feeding was so bad. I don't think we're gonna have any issues moving to next year. The magic number on bean leaf beetles, 16 degrees. I think we had a really cold January. Haven't seen the numbers yet, but came off a record warm December, but a really cold January. 16 degrees will do some damage on bean leaf beetles. And we had a lot of wind blowing into the cover where they were at, and it was well below 16. Japanese beetles, entomologists will tell you when you see high level, high, high level numbers, 
they're going to crash. And we see that. So they'll start a rebuilding phase. We'll keep your eyes on those. Stink bugs, if you're a seed grower, we're paid on quality, right? We don't want stink bugs coming in late in the growing season and uh, damaging our pods. So we're done, right? We've made our R2, R3 application. Love that sound. It's five o'clock somewhere, right? It's time for vacation. We did all the things we've needed to do, right? We made that late R2, R3 applications. It's late July. Kids are going back to school in three or four weeks. We got to squeeze in another camping trip. Got to get the boating in. State fair's coming up. Kids got to show the cattle, right? We're done. We've done everything we could do. Don't worry. This is just Diet Coke. It's just a huggy. I actually stopped at the convenience store to grab a real beer, but somebody told me that there's a snowstorm coming. They must have bought all the beer. Post R3 opportunities, defense and offense, we're right back to it. Def defensively, easy. Insecticide, fungicide. We want to keep that plant alive longer. We want to protect it. The insects don't go away. Fungal pathogens don't either. Offensively, again, fungicides keep it alive longer. Nutrition, soluble P and K. Nitrogen, I've got 30% there. Why do I have 30%? Because that's what we need to get out of the soil. Because only about 70% of the nitrogen needs are, are through fixation. And what happens to the, to the nodules at about R3, R4? They slow down. Why do they slow down? Because the plant's slowing down. Its allocation needs are different. It starts to go to that source sink. It's putting more to the seed and less to the roots. Well, the roots are what feed the nodules. That's why I recommend a sugar. If we can send a, a sugar, that plant, when it takes in a sugar, it automatically translocates it down to the roots. We can give that nodule just a little bit of a shock saying, oh, wait, I'm not done yet. I got a little bit more left in the tank. Products that influence seed size and seed weight. Again, that source to sink relationship. If we learned anything about 2021 as a growing season, it was that our fungicides only gave us 14 to 21 days of protection. I called the aerial applicators to say, hey, I've got some corn and bean fields that I'd like to do a double shot on. Their response, yeah, we applied 185,000 acres, we're done. I don't blame them, but moving forward, there's opportunity. Here's another PTI uh, farm uh, slide looking at different fungicide timings. And again, when we started fungicide application years ago, it was R2, R3. We're starting to move more towards a better response out of R3. Why is that? I'm not going to say it's climate change, but I will say that our weather's changed. Our insect patterns have changed. So maybe that R2, R3 wasn't the best timing. Same thing with corn. We learned that this year. Maybe brown silk was a whole lot better timing than tassel time. So we look at an R1, great response, picking up 5.3 bushel. Go to R3, six and a half bushel. But what, just what? What if we did two apps? R1 and R3. What if we did R1 and R4? Again, lots of opportunity for making those applications to include some sort of foliar nutrition. Bulk that seed. Nutrient uptake, uptake curves, growers, we've seen this a million times, but we can't stress this enough that 50% of our nutrients are taken in after R2. 50%, that's a ton of nutrition in NP and K. So why participate in yield contests? In growers out here, raise your hand, growers. We're all retailers, no growers. We got growers out there. Find products to incorporate in your cropping systems. Learn from the industry professionals. Build relationships with your retailer and salesman. Retailers, this is a great opportunity too. You can build the relationships with your growers, look at new products, collect data off of them in different environments. Touch points, we don't get enough of them as retailers. These are great ways to continue touch points with our growers throughout the growing season. Stay current with new industry products. I'm a last slide here. Show me your friends, I'll show you your future. It's a great saying. When it comes to soybeans, there's some really great characters out there in the soybean industry. Dr. Sean Conley, 
You don't think of, you, of Wisconsin as a soybean state, but Conley does a fantastic job. There's his contact info. A.J. Woodyard, A.J. is a great, great friend of mine. A lot of you remember him from BASF. He's now with Advanced Agrolytics. Check them out. He's their lead agronomist. Jason Webster does a great job at the PTI farm. He's their lead agronomist. And Dr. Fred Bilo here at the great University of Illinois, plant physiology. His six, six secrets to soybean success. And I can't leave out our soy advisors. Great information distributed by them as well.